Uh, hello, everyone. I am your host, John Rian, and my guest today on the Always Direct podcast is Ron Holt, CEO and founder of Two Maids in a Mop. He's currently serving 81 markets across the country. Uh, he's been recognized by Inc. Magazine as the eighth fastest growing franchise brand in America. Uh, his company is awesome. I can't wait to learn about his story. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. You bet, John. Thanks for having me here. It's an honor. True honor to be here. I can't wait to talk about myself. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> That's what we're here for, right? We, make, we take the awkwardness away of talking about yourself. So, yeah. I, 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 you know, I, I want to talk about your, your company, where you are right now. And then I want to go and dive into your history. I want to know the, the nitty gritty details of like the early days, the, some of the dark days, some of the bad stuff that happened. So that way we can possibly plant some seeds and nuggets in people who listen to this on, the, on YouTube. Of course. Yeah, man. I can't, I, I can talk about plenty of dark days, the, the, those early days. I go back 18 years, you know, this is, uh, we've had so much success over the last several years, but it's not a overnight success story. There was a lot of sacrifice, a lot of hard work, a lot of investment during those early, early years when I was literally cleaning a house, you know? So yeah, let's, let's dive right into it. All right. Sounds good. So where are you now right now currently in your company? I mean, I saw the revenues, uh, um, um, I saw your revenues on your LinkedIn profile um, and I seen you on CNBC. Uh, so just yeah. think about where you are right now. How's your company doing? If Anything you're able to disclose? Of course. Yeah. So uh, things are great right now. We have uh, 89 locations and growing. Uh, COVID was bad, you know, for everyone. And we had a tough spring, but believe it or not, we have rebounded like never i've never seen anything like it when it when it's when we're talking about consumer demand and even franchise investment interest it's it's just been crazy crazy good you know but yeah things are going really well right now we have 89 locations it's a long way from that one store you know in pensacola florida 18 years ago uh, and so all the things that are happening now are you know all the things that i dreamed about are literal realities now it's crazy to think about it that way yeah, 89 locate 89 people depending on you. I mean, I'm sure some of them have multiple lo multiple uh, locations, right? So, how many franchises do you have? Franchise yeah, so a lot of what we have are single units. Uh, we have always believed that that to start a franchise with us, we want you to sort of be in the weeds for a little bit, you know. So we uh, we have 89 franchises, and of that, I don't know the exact number, but probably 81 or 82 are, are actual franchisees. And so most are single store units. There's a lot of people who are really looking at other opportunities in their adjacent territories for other growth. In fact, in the last 12 months, we've seen a lot of that. We've seen about a handful of our uh, grandfathered um, um, franchisees who have taken the opportunity of all the demand we're seeing uh, you know, during COVID and even now you know, kind of coming out of the lockdowns um, to purchase other territories. Now, so some of those early guys who took a chance on us when we first started franchising or have been rewarded in their business. And now they're, they're, they're doubling down in some cases, tripling down uh, with, with other territories. You guys, you guys have a, you have a different type of uh, compensation plan for your employees. I mean, that's kind of what separates you from the past. Yeah. What are your I love talking about it. It's, it's, oh. it's our, so this takes us back to the early days for me to tell you a little bit of history behind it. So in the early days, I didn't know what I was doing. Like house cleaning was not my forte sure. at all. Uh, I love the idea behind it, the industry, the demand. I, I saw a lot of fragmentation. I really felt like there was a real opportunity to disrupt the industry, but I never really thought that hard about the physical act of cleaning until I physically had to do the work. And I learned pretty quickly that it's hard work. It's not very glamorous at all. And, you know, it, there's not a ton of career opportunities that come from it because you're cleaning a house. And once you have a, someone managing you, it's that's sort of the career path. That's the work chart. And so um, it, it took some hard life lessons inside the business to figure out that I had to figure out a way to get our people to care as much as me because the work itself was so hard and it was done out in the field away from me. There was no quality control department. Yeah, the quality control department literally was our customer. And so I had to figure out a way to get our people to care like me in also facing all the realities of the work itself, the physical nature of the trade. And so um, I'm a big book reader, like a complete nerd when it comes to those things. And so I was on a plane actually to Omaha, Nebraska, many, many years ago uh, to see this dude behind me, uh, Warren Buffett. 
and on the way I picked up a book in the Atlanta airport. I was stuck there and it was called Purple Cow, Purple Cow by a guy named Seth Godin. And uh, if you've ever heard of the book, it's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a legend in the marketing world. It's, it's pretty easy to, you don't have to read the book. I'll give you this synopsis. If you okay. were to drive through a rural area and see a bunch of cows and one was purple and the others looked like every other cow, then that purple cow would stick out. And it resonated with me. It's very simple, uh, a book, very simple analogy to, 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 the, to business, to life, whatever. But it stuck to me because I felt like I could combine the purple cow principle with the uh, deficiency and the weakness I saw with our employees doing such hard jobs, but not having a true vested interest in, in their work. And so it took me a while to kind of come up with this grand idea. I didn't necessarily figure it out on the way to Omaha and back. Uh, but eventually I settled on this pay for performance plan that you talked about just a minute ago. It's become our staple. It is our purple cow today. Basically, every time we clean someone's home, we give our customers a, an opportunity to rate their level of satisfaction on a pretty simple scale of just one to 10. And that number by itself will directly determine the actual compensation level for the two folks who clean that house. And you know, I've said that so many times over the years, sometimes to consumers, sometimes to franchise candidates. And almost every single time I say it, people go, oh, my gosh, that's a great idea. I get why it works. And it does. It gets people it gives people an ownership mentality. It gives people a reason to hire us uh, because it's different. You know, in the maid service world, it is highly fragmented. However, at the same time, everybody looks the same. Everybody says the same stuff. All the rates are essentially the same. And so when it comes time to make a hiring decision, oftentimes it's who's cheapest or who can just do the work. In our case, people hire us because of that pay for performance plan. And it's become the reason, in my opinion, that we are the brand we are today. Without it, I'm not sure that we'd be able to, to pull off the success we've created. Sure, sure. So so you give them a base. How does it work exactly? Like you give them a base. This is what you're getting paid. And then the customer then gets a text message and makes a review. Is that how it works? Could you sort of, sort of, but it's a true pay for performance plan. Now we have to honor labor laws. And so they're, they're going to get paid something, you know, it could be minimum wage. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's truly the base is minimum wage. And so the customer will rate their happiness on a one to 10 scale. 10 is great. One's really not good. Um, and if it's a 10, you're going to get paid above market wages. You know, it's going to be something that you're really excited about. And the same goes if you're paid, if you're rated a one, you're going to get paid crap just to be quite, you know, frank with you. Sure. Uh, very few, very, very few people are in that, are in that, in, in that range, however. Um, and in our world, it's, it's true pay for performance. You know, we, we were able to, to see the results pretty quickly and, a couple of things happen if there is negative feedback. Obviously, we, we have to take care of the customer and redo some of the work potentially. Uh, but for the for the employee, there is a, a coaching period that follows a really negative review, a, a one or a two rating or whatever. And then after that, there, there sometimes is some natural selection going on because no one wants to get paid minimum wage to do anything. And so uh, a couple of jobs where you underperform and get underpaid, um, usually kind of takes care of itself, quite frankly. Uh, but that doesn't happen a lot. I mean, the, the, we, sure. we have some really great metrics in our system. And believe it or not, the average rating is about 9.8. Uh, when we look at all the ratings we get across the country in every location, we, we're cleaning hundreds of homes a day. Uh, the average is 9.8. So most people are pretty satisfied and happy. And I think it's because our employees know when they go out and they clean someone's home, that customer's opinion is going to make or break their paycheck. Yeah, I lo I really like your, your your logic, and not only that, but I'm, I was thinking about it, and I was like, my God, he's built a he's built a way to keep track of the quality of each franchisee built into the system. So like, without even having to do an outside, you know, investigation as to how everybody's doing, it's automatically coming to you. So that each job, you're like, yeah. not, you're you're current, you're currently knowing exactly what's happening in your business across the. Uh, the country, which is cool. Yeah, yeah, we have a bunch of KPIs, like a lot of brands do, but that's probably one of the most important ones. And so, our we have field reps that support our franchisees and coach our franchisees. And if that KPI dips, then we know we need to to take some action to figure out what's going on. Yeah, I mean, and then I was also thinking, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. So, so now you have two, it's two ladies in a mop, but you, that's not always 
the case, right? It might be three, it might be one. I mean, is it, 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 uh, it but is it always two? It's much? usually two. The only time it's not two, honestly, is if we're training. You know, sometimes when we send people through a training process, it will be three maids in a mop. Gotcha. Uh, but typically it's it's two maids in a mop. There, there's the occasional one person, like if it's a, a small apartment. apartment yeah. You know, you'd, you'd be surprised. Some Most people think maid services are these McMansions, 5,000 square foot homes, you know, in suburbia. And we do certainly clean a lot of those, but we have a plenty of folks who just want us to come in and just clean their refrigerator, you know? And so we'll send one person to do something like that, but typically it's two people. Sure. So I was thinking, I was thinking how, another reason why I really like this is because, so you put in two people in a house, they're going to start cleaning. And I, um, and then all of a sudden they're ready to leave. And one, one, they're constantly policing each other internally. Like they're not telling at each other, but like, no, you didn't, come on, you, you missed the spot. You missed, you know, they're kind of, there's a camaraderie that they have to do a good job together. Otherwise they won't get paid properly. So, I mean, it all works out really well. I really like the idea. I mean, I'm just thinking, yeah. of talking about it. Yeah. There, there's a lot of good to it. It, the, the bad is when there is, you know, we're people, we're not robots. And so there are mistakes made. We're, we're there's a, a few negative feed, you know, ratings that, that roll in. But the beauty of that is, like I said earlier, some natural selection sort of takes over yes. and that, that doesn't persist very long, you know? So the, usually when we do have some, if we do have a negative, negative experience with the customer, it's very short lived because of the rating system. All right, cool, cool. I, I, so that's your purple cow. And I'm going to start yeah. using that, by the way, purple cow. <laughs> um, so I want to, I want to, you know, you're obviously successful now. You're, you know, your company is growing. Um, franchisees are making a lot of money from what I could see on the, on your franchise page. Um, average unit value, average profit is like 160,000. I don't know, this is pre pandemic, but I mean, pretty good, pretty darn good. They're making a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, last year we, yeah, in a nutshell, they're doing very well. Uh, the average franchisee that's especially that's over two years old is kick and tell, you know, because in our, in our industry, if you think about, I mean, think about it just in your local area, anyone listening to this, try to talk to 10 of your friends, just 10 of those and ask the question, do you hire maid service? The majority of folks do nowadays. And when we started this 18 years ago, that wasn't the case. I felt like that was a, a trend that would occur. Uh, it was a, it was a, it wasn't that risky of a, of a bet in my opinion, because when I looked around all the other home service industries like lawn services and carpet cleaning, no one did that themselves. Everyone hired someone to do it. And I assumed that at some point there would be a little bit of a cultural tipping point when a consumer or a homeowner would say, Hey, it's okay to hire someone. You know, in the, in the old, old days, people who hired us were like super wealthy and, they did live in those big mansions and they bragged about it and they did it because they wanted to, not because they needed to. Nowadays, everyone's dual income, you know, it, everyone's busy. There's nobody that just has lots and lots of time. Everyone's, you know, rocking and rolling somewhere. And we're the beneficiary of that because no one has time to clean. Really, no one really wants to do it either. Uh, but the, the biggest factor that changed a lot of the industry is just the amount of time that gets just soaked up in life nowadays. And, you know, somebody's got to clean the house. And during COVID, it changed even uh, more significantly because it became different. In the old days, again, we used to clean houses to like, get rid of dust bunnies and make the house look pretty. We still do that. But COVID changed everything because now we, on top of cleaning the dust bunnies, we disinfect the home. We, we eliminate germs and bacteria. We make the home healthier. And, and that's been in my opinion, one of the biggest changes to the business model over the last 12 months. Yeah, definitely. I mean, everybody I know gets a lady, uh, a company to come at least once a week or once every two weeks. I personally do as well. And, um, you know, I don't live in a huge house. I live in a 2,200 square foot house. And But I have three little kids, a dog that sheds like crazy. And my wife, you know, happy wife, happy life type situation. I'm like, you know what? Right. <laughs> just bring somebody yeah. once a week, help us out. So here's how it goes down. The, the guys never hire us. It's always the female, but the, the person in the house that's happiest about the decision is the guy. Isn't that funny? Because, because the wife is happy and, you know, that gives you time to 
have dinner together as a family and do the sports and, you know, all the activities together. Well, but, but I mean, uh, you know, coming home to a, a, an organized house, a clean house, it, it, it's, it's like a Zen feel, like a meditation almost like you feel relaxed. You walk you in, do. there's toys everywhere. You go a little, I go, I go crazy. I cannot handle it. I cannot handle clutter personally. How about you? <laughs> yeah. I, well, I, I do have two small kids and cut clutter has become sort of a way of life, but yeah, we, <laughs> It is very stressful to see 400 toys on the floor. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> All right, so Ron, let's let's dive in deep to the to the early days. What gave you the the, the guts to, to to franchise your business? But for, before we get there, what what gave you the so you just what what made you crazy enough to decide to open up a a maid service? So I'll give you the, the quickest story possible because I could talk for an hour just on that evolution. Sure. So I was like a lot of entrepreneurs inside corporate America, could not stand it. You know, I had like little, I lived in Atlanta, Georgia. And if you've ever been to Atlanta, traffic stinks. And so I'm stuck in Atlanta traffic every single morning, 45 minutes to an hour plus to go like three miles. And, you know, the whole way there, I'm just, my stomach is just turning because I couldn't stand it. And here's the weird part. I was making a bunch of money. I was in a high, pretty high level management position. I was working inside a laboratory of all things. I have a, a biology background and I uh, should have been happy. You know, like I was living this American dream. I was in my mid twenties. I mean, things should have been great, uh, but I could not stand my life at the time. I wanted to have a bigger purpose. And so I felt like my purpose was gonna go through business ownership, starting a business, being an entrepreneur. And I didn't know what it was going to be, had no idea it was going to end up being inside the residential cleaning industry. But step one towards that was actually inside that laboratory. Inside the lab, we had a lot of clients, but they were all the same clients over and over again. I didn't have a business background, so I didn't know it was called recurring revenue. Uh, but I saw firsthand how impactful and really how profitable recurring revenue could be for a business. And that led me to sort of step one to the discovery of an entrepreneur I knew that whatever business it was going to be needed to be service-based because, again, the recurring revenue side of it. Um, step two, it's, it's again, inside that same laboratory, I, I recognized one of the reasons we were so successful is because we offered something that very few people could provide. We were one of only two laboratories in North America could, that, that could perform this type of test we were doing. And that meant we didn't have to be the best marketers in the world. We didn't have to invest even a whole lot in marketing. The investment was in the technology and the people that performed all the, the work. And so I felt like I would be able to find a similar service industry where there would be an opportunity to become a category of one, I call it, where you could sort of just separate yourself and not have to outspend, but just be, um, you know, sort of at the top of the mountain, you know, and so that, believe it or not, led me to consumer services. When I looked at consumer services, I knew that it had recurring revenue inside of it. Um, but I also felt like everyone doing the work, all the tradespeople doing the work, just did the work. They didn't really get too caught up in technology or marketing. They didn't really care about the business model. They cared about mowing the yard, cleaning the carpets, and you know, uh, dusting the, the nightstands. And so I put my sights, you know, right on the consumer services space. And then once I was inside that, I started researching every single sub market. And eventually uh, I read this article about the residential cleaning industry. This was 20 years ago. And it said at the time, 95% of the residential cleaning industry was comprised of mom and pop operators, folks who just, you know, cleaned on the side, maybe even just on the weekend. They didn't really want to build this million dollar enterprise. They just wanted to clean their three homes a week and, and be done. 95% of the industry was, was that way. And I felt like if all those folks who were doing that work were just focused on cleaning, you know, the art, the, the science of cleaning, then there had to be huge opportunities to transform and really disrupt that particular industry. And so that literally is the reason I've set my sights on residential cleaning, not because I fell in love with the idea of cleaning, not because I knew anyone inside the industry that, that had success. It was just sort of analytical thinking that said residential cleaning will one day be an industry uh, that's populated by brands like, uh, like we are today. And why not be in front of that wave? Uh, so that, that's what- How old were you at the time you said? I'm sorry. Uh, I was in my mid-20s. When I first opened on day one, which was April Fool's Day, believe it or not, 
Uh, I was 28 <laughs> years old. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought I knew everything, you know, like every, you know, 20 something does, but I uh, realized pretty quickly, I didn't know a whole lot. I had come from this management world. And so I was very fortunate, like I said, to, to be in this corporate America setting where I managed people and I managed everyone from PhDs with chemical engineering degrees to really, really intelligent, high aptitude chemists and biologists. And, and um, all these folks were super smart, but I was their boss. They were 40, 50 years old. The main reason is because they didn't want to be the boss. They didn't want the business side of it. They wanted to work. Uh, they liked the work a lot more than I did and were much better at it. And I said, well, I'll, I'll be the boss. And so I managed all these 40, 50, in some cases, 60 year old uh, men and women. And I thought I knew how to manage folks. And then I started two maids in a mob and realized I knew nothing about managing blue collar employees. That was a complete uh, hard learning lesson that I had to go through during those early days. Yeah, definitely. And then, so, so you open up, do you have any, you, are you the only person working? I mean, you, you had a, I think I read you had a 250 square foot office. There you go. Yep. So it was a tiny little 250 square foot space. It was downright ugly, you know, like the <laughs> barely had carpet holes in the wall. There were train tracks on three of the four sides. And it was, it was an old, um, it was in Florida. So just bear with me here. It was an old storage facility that somebody said, I'll throw some stucco around this and call it an office complex. And so when the train would roll by, it would shake the building. And if you're on the <laughs> phone with a customer, you, they couldn't even hear you. Uh, and it was kind of scary if, if you had never been in the office before, because you thought you were going to get run over. Uh, but yeah, that was our first office. It, it, uh, it wasn't just me on the first day, but it sort of was just me on the first day because we had so much turnover early on because I just didn't know how to hire, who to hire, how to manage these folks. Uh, it, it, it was a complete train wreck in those early days. We only cleaned two homes the first day. We made $110. So we, it wasn't the grandest of grand openings, to say the least. Sure. So, so, so you, what was your marketing strategy back then? And, 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 and how long did it take you to break, start making money? Yeah. So our marketing strategy, this is going to really date me. Uh, but back in those days, home services like residential cleaning companies, two maids and a mop, the, the way to advertise was to bid, get a really big ad, usually a full page ad, sometimes even a two page ad, and this thing called the yellow pages. Mm, um, I've heard sure of anyone, yeah. <laughs> and so we, we did a lot of that. Uh, we advertised in these other things that were black and white. I don't know if you've heard of these newspapers. Mm. And they, a lot has changed obviously from those days. Uh, we kind of followed the herd early on, and that also meant we kind of followed the growth of our local industry. We didn't necessarily take over the industry very quickly. In fact, it took me two years to even make my first dollar of profit. Eventually, I said, two years. It was two, two long, hard years. Thank goodness I had bankrolled the business prior to that to sort of capitalize it with my own private money. Um, but if I didn't have the, the money behind me, there was no way we could have made it because there was no profits, you know, it took me three years even to get my first paycheck. So two years to make money, but three years to earn a paycheck. It was a uh, tough times. The, the real trigger that changed everything was marketing though. You talked about how do we market? Like I said, we followed the herd a lot early on, but eventually I said, you know, I'm not going to be able to be able to outspend our, our folks in our industry. And then most of the people I was competing against had been in the industry for a long time, you know, for 10, 15 years. And they had a pretty well-known name in the area. We were this nobody. And so uh, I knew that we had to do something different. Difference, a pretty common theme in my world, a contrarian way of thinking. And so this is also going to date me, but SEO and digital marketing, all these things that are very common today were not common in the mid to late 2000s. And I felt like we could get in front of that curve. And so I just poured everything into learning about pay-per-click marketing, search engine optimization, and just became an expert on it at the time. Things have changed so much over the years. I'm probably no longer an expert, but back in those days I was. And so that's really what changed everything. Once we started talking about the paper performance plan to the right people, uh, cause the right people weren't calling us, you know, uh, the yellow page ad wasn't necessarily generating a lot of calls, but the calls that was it was generating was the wrong demographic. The pay per click and the SEO work that we put into it allowed us to find the right people. And then whenever we talked to them about the pay for performance plan, it was gold. 
And that changed everything. And it also reduced our marketing. So it went, it, you never find better and cheaper. But when it came to how we were marketing back in those days, the, the internet allowed us to be better and cheaper, uh, and have a much higher ROI than what we were seeing in print in those early days. And that's the same model we use today. The difference is I'm no longer the expert. We have this great marketing team that's here at home office and they handle everything for all of our franchisees. You don't have to be an SEO expert. All you got to do is just wait for the phone to ring and magically it happens. So Ron, <clears throat> when did you, so you started your business at 28, took you two years to make a profit three years before you took a check, but where in that whole three year plan did you, the pay for, pay for um, performance? When did that happen? Like, I, I don't know when that started because that makes sure. sense. It, it it happened about almost two years in, about a year and a half to two years in. Um, the the first several months, I this is gosh, I'm sounding like an old grandpa here. But in, back <laughs> in my day, um, you would you would go you would walk into someone's home like they wanted you to walk in their home, meet you, break you know bread together. Like I I remember spending two hours with a an older couple in Florida to clean their home you know, a couple of weeks later for a hundred bucks, you know, and like we had this two hour meeting about it. And so I was, I was earning a lot of work, but mainly because I was able to just go sell myself. And I would always tell people about the vision for what I had for the business down the road. And very few cleaning companies was, was talking about things like that. And so when I would walk into someone's house, bat my blue eyes, it would usually, I would usually earn the job. But as we started growing, I knew that if we were going to scale, that it had to be bigger than, than me. I couldn't just go and walk into everyone's home because that was impossible, not realistic. And again, we had a lot of those other issues I talked about when it came to an ownership mentality. And so when we started talking about the pay for performance plan, I stopped having to go into all these homes um, and people started hiring us because of that. The problem is we still didn't have a lot of volume. You know, the calls weren't coming in. So we'd get one call a day, talk about the pay for performance plan. We'd go one for one, but you need more than one new customer a day in this business. And so the marketing side of what we do combined with the pay for performance plan around the year and a half to two year mark completely transformed the business. It, 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 it was a, a tough period. We were no doubt in the, in the red. Uh, and I thank goodness had that private capital behind me but it was dwindling and there was no bank, there was no investors, there was no mom and dad to help me. It was, it was my money or bust. And so uh, a lot of desperation, you know, inside, inside of that, uh, but it was good desperation too, because it, it forced me to become this like hustler. You know, I had to figure out a way to market to get the phones to ring. I had to figure out a way to sell the service once they called. I had to figure out a way to get our people to care once they clean, you know, for our customers all these things that I didn't know I was going to have to deal with or encounter, I was forced to encounter uh, as a guy on an island, basically. Um, and it was tough during those early, early days, but thank goodness I went through it. It's, you know, a lot of things people say blessing in disguises. It was a complete blessing in disguise, every pain point that I had to go through because we now look at our business and our brand today, other than software development, I have no idea how to code, but other than software development, I have performed every single role in our business from HR to payroll, to marketing, to even cleaning. That's right. And that's, that's honestly, that's, that's what happens when you bring in CEOs from outside and they've never actually done the, the nitty gritty. It almost always, right. business. almost. I always. agree. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen it. I've seen it with some peer uh, brands in the franchise space uh, many times. Yeah. So, Let's dive in a little bit uh, with regards to now you're three years in, things are starting to turn around. You can see the light at the end of the tunnel. How did you, in those three years, or maybe uh, tell me what around what year did you realize that you need to create better systems and like start better checklists? And how do you do the checklist? How does that's, that work? Yeah, that's such a good question because I didn't know it until I, it, it, I was pretty deep into the business. And so we had- <laughs> Isn't that funny? Second, I know you so muscle you muscle through it. You know you just muscled yeah. your health. You didn't know what you're doing, but you just muscled through it, and then you realize, hey, I should probably have some checklists. Yeah. So I we had our one store. It took us a couple of years, like we said. I opened a second store shortly after that. Third store, fourth store. We had twelve stores eventually. We all they were all corporate. These were not franchise locations. So we had twelve corporate stores from the Carolinas down to Florida, and 
from the outside looking in, things were going really well. You know, we were getting a few awards here and there, growth was strong, but the bottom line wasn't as neat as I would have liked for it to have been. In fact, when I looked at those individual 12 stores, there were some locations that would have very similar top line revenue numbers, but their bottom lines were completely different. You know, and I'm like, what the heck's going on? And so about that time, like I said, super big nerd right here, read way too much. And I read a book called The E-Myth, which is, you know, I now remember. I know it's, yeah, the franchise Bible. And it talks about system and process. And if you can believe a book about systems and process is exciting, it is. And it uh, was enlightening to me because everything he talked about in that book was happening to Two Maids in the Mop at that time. We had all these cells just pouring in, opening new locations. I was on top of the world, but I was like, why are we not making any money? And so when I filled back all of the business entities and looked at all the different 12 stores, I recognized that there was no system or process. And, you know, there were some pretty glaring examples, for instance, I didn't care about uniforms. You know, it's funny because the definition of uniform is the same thing. But in Charlotte, North Carolina, the, the girl we have mostly females, the girls would say, I don't, I don't want to wear these colors. I want to wear these colors. And I'm like, wear them. Um, in Florida, they're like, I want to wear these colors, not those colors. And I'm like, wear them. And so if you went into one of our 12 stores, they're all going to look different. You know, they were all called two maids and a mop, but completely different. Uh, cleaning was Definitely a different way. You know, I don't know if you've heard this before, but barbecue in North Carolina is different than barbecue in Alabama and barbecue in Tennessee is different than barbecue in Missouri. Sure. Well, cleaning is different in North Carolina too, apparently than Florida and so on. Um, because every time we would open a new store, they'd say, that ain't how we do it here. This is how you do it. <laughs> and you know, I never cared about cleaning that much. So I'm like, all right, that's how you do it. But that's that was not the way to do it because you had all this fragmentation within, within business. And so eventually I pulled all of our managers in-house. We, we had since at that time relocated from Pensacola, Florida to Birmingham, Alabama, which is where we're at now. And we sat across a table in a conference room for several weeks and we built our first operations manual, really, which was you know, built on the same principles of the, the E-Myth book. And that served as sort of our step towards franchising. We didn't know it at the time, we would be a franchise brand. Uh, but it, it normalized everything. We did look the same. We cleaned the same. We priced the same. Everything was the same, including the bottom line of every individual store. If they had the same revenue, they had the same bottom line. And um, I was fortunate to, to meet an industry person inside the franchise space who said, hey, you know, you should franchise. And I'm like, what the heck's that? You know, like, I, I don't know how to franchise. He said, you already are. You've got systems. You've got scale. You've got profitability. You've got a unique business model. You, you should franchise, and so that really was the precipice to wh where we are today. That's 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 a beautiful story in a nutshell. But I know it's a lot more complicated than that. Can I dive a little bit deeper into the the systems and procedures? Because that's I really want I really want to focus on that because it's, that's the hardest part, right? Because it's it is. Today. Everybody says, oh, yeah, Michael Gerber, Ebith, make some systems, write, down, write it all down, and then implement them. Yeah, okay, that, that's – talk is cheap. Actually doing it is a hell. It's actual hell because right. you've got to change old habits. You have to implement them. You have to follow up. Who, who's checking the checklists? Okay, you're doing the right. checklist? Who's checking the checklist? And if not, what do you do at that point? Like, how, did, how long did it take you to, to actually to start it? to implement it and then to actually, um, you know, perfect it. And did you get outside help at all? We did, yeah. So actually, oh, Michael Gerber ha has a business that provides this type of consultation. And so we hired Michael Gerber's uh, business. He actually sent the COO of Michael Gerber Institute to Birmingham. And he basically lived with us for several weeks. We brought in cleaning experts that really loved cleaning, the, uh, the, the art and science of cleaning. We brought in sales experts to help us with uh, a script and developing process around that. We even brought in pricing experts and even fashion experts to help us. And then we had the 12, we had 12 managers at the 12 corporate stores we had. And so we, we kind of put everybody together. And like I said, it was weeks and it was a little risky, very risky actually, because we brought all of the talent from the business was removed um, and brought to Birmingham for several weeks. And so we had all these basically assistant managers running the show while we were inside conference rooms day after day. But I knew that if we didn't do something like this, this drastic, 
then it was going to, it was going to die, die anyway, you know, so I had, I had to take the chance. And so uh, we sat around and we started from step one, which is, you know, how to, how to get the job, you know, to at the end, like what happens after the job is complete. And so we, we, we went way, way into the weeds. For instance, how do you enter a home when someone's there? How do you enter a home when someone's not there? You know, how, how do you price a home that's empty versus price a home that's, you know, has a family of five living there? All these things that seem very uh, just normal, we, we, we broke down into step-by-step -step processes. And it, you know, a lot of people would, would say, well, it's cleaning, you know, and people, you can't make cleaning like McDonald's. You can't make this a Subway sandwich. You can. Uh, you can make the same cleaning occur in Charlotte, North Carolina that occurs in Dallas, Texas. It, they don't have to look or feel the same, different. Um, and so you throw all that together. I had, I had a mountain, I wish I still had it. I had a mountain of notes from these weeks and weeks of work. I spent a lot of money with these consultants that we brought in, uh, a lot of money on people too, because we had to house them in Birmingham this whole time. And then this is the fun part. Um, after I had all these notes, I'm like, okay, what do I do now? And so I, I was still self-capitalized at the time. Um, and so I said, I could hire someone to document all this and build an operations manual, or I could do it. I actually am, a, I said I'm a nerd, I like to read. I also like to write. And so this is where it kind of gets weird and crazy, but also fun. My wife and I just had a little baby boy and we took off to Nassau, Bahamas for weeks. And all I said, here's what we're going to do. You know, we don't have kids in school or anything like that. I've already proven that the business can operate a little bit without me because I've been in a conference room in Birmingham for the last several weeks. We're going to go to the Bahamas. I'm going to build the operations manual, meaning I'm going to write every day. You play in the sun. I'll join you every now and then, but my main priority is just to get away from the, the life, you know, the, the work. And so I can really build process. And so that's what I did. And so today's operations manual, which is now 500 pages long, about 350 of those were written in the Bahamas uh, by me. <laughs> so wow. um, it, it was a, it was a fun experience, uh, but also very stressful and challenging because it's every, every process would take you in so many different directions because you would think how to clean a house would be very straightforward, but inside that house, there's a kitchen inside that house. There's a bathroom inside that house. There may be a, a sunroom or whatever. And oftentimes you, you have to figure out how to even clean different, how to, how to drive up to a home. It's a process. You know, you can't where to park is a process. You know, all those things that we really took for granted, we had to create real systems around and it was very tedious as a result. Yeah, it, it's I, I've been through it. I'm in the restaurant business. I know I know everything you're talking about. I'm in. Uh, it's so difficult. It's so difficult. They they make it seem so easy, but it's not. It, how to clean a bathroom? There's a million ways, and there's a million variables involved with just cleaning a bathroom. Um, you know how to walk into a house. You know how to be respectful. How to you know you know how to handle certain awkward situations or bad situations you might walk into. I mean, you walk into somebody's home. I mean, I can just imagine it's not easy. I, I, at least because I have experience in this type of you know. Um, we, we we even have systems on how to leave. You know, like you, you would think <laughs> that's pretty easy to just sure. leave, right? But if someone's home and they're working in their office, you don't want to just leave. And then they're like, are they, are they here? Did they leave? You know, there's a process to how you exit a home when someone is there. Uh, we yeah. took those things for granted until we really got serious about it. Well, you, they, you thought, you thought that it was common. So you thought a lot of it was common sense, but it's not. Right. <laughs> it's not common sense. is not common. Yeah. And, and then everybody's got a different way of looking at things. So, you know, right. Never so assume guys, anything. Never assume. Yeah, yeah. You know the saying, right? It makes an ass out of you and me. <laughs> so, so 12 locations. Can I ask you, well, you were in Florida originally. Is that where you were living? We were in Florida at the time, yeah. Why did you decide to go to the you know, Carolinas or, or Georgia or any other or Alabama? Why did you decide to, to expand it to different states as opposed to focusing on dominating Florida first? Unless you did already. Yeah, well, so we were in northern Florida and the northwest Florida panhandle of florida and that's believe it or not pensacola is closer to birmingham alabama than jacksonville florida or, or tampa florida yeah, yeah. so we were, we were really just looking at opportunities that were within our area and once we were in birmingham and once we were in atlanta 
well, then we're close to Charlotte, then we're close to Nashville, gotcha. you know, then we're close to Knoxville and, and so on. And so we just kept kind of going north. Um, ironically, today, the largest footprint we have is in the state of Florida. Uh, and I don't know, I don't think it's because of our origins are there. I just think there's a lot of people who want to live there and money follows them, you know, and so there, sure. and, and there's a lot of demand uh, because of, and it's 12 months of work, you know, and oftentimes in some of the uh, cold weather states, you know, a winter storm will really depress demand in, in for, for our services, but pretty much have 12 months, 12 months of good weather there. Yeah, I just um, uh, went on a road trip and I drove through Alabama and I went to um, Panama City Beach with my family. Yeah, 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 yeah. I stayed there for about five days and we, we I, it's like a hidden gem. It is. It's it, 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 we, that was our third location, Panama City. And, you know, I had these like in my mind, like these spring break visions, but it, there's a lot of, there's a lot of families that live there. And we do, a, we, do we did a lot of work with the tourism industry there all throughout the state we do, but it's the, still the main bread and butter for our businesses in Florida are still residential homeowners, not, not the tourism thing that you would, you would imagine. Yeah, I imagine, but it kind of, there's a lot of condos that they rent out there. So I'm yep, sure you're yep. those. We do, we do, it, but the tourism trade creates income. It creates, you know, opportunities and jobs for people in the local area, and um, that that those folks live in homes, you know, and they're busy doing their jobs. And when they're not doing their jobs, they live in Florida for one reason, you know, to be outside, and so they don't want to be inside their house to to clean. Definitely. So, Rod, you you, I, I've learned a lot from you. I got to be honest with you, and I, and I hope anybody who listens to this gets some uh, nuggets from you, but. Um, you spent a lot of money on those consultants, bringing in the CEO of uh, Michael Gerber company, the, the E-Myth uh, company, bringing in, you know, clothing experts and or fashion experts, bringing in uh, cleaning specialists. And this was all done over the course of a couple of weeks. And you brought all your managers, shipped them yep. in, paid for the housing, paid for the consultants. And this whole time you probably were like, holy shit, this is a lot of money I'm spending right now. I hope this, this pans out. Right. So tell me what was going through your mind and then what was the result? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I knew it was going to be costly, very risky. But again, I felt like if, if I didn't do something this drastic, we were going to fail anyways. You know, revenue was strong, lots of great buzz around the brand. Um, outside looking in, people said, man, you guys are killing it. But I knew internally that we we were, you know, it was there was there was definitely some imperfection. So even though there was a lot of investment there, it felt like it was a no brainer because if I didn't do it, I was going to end up in a dying a slow death anyway, you know, so that, that was sort of the way I thought about it. Uh, I, I am a true entrepreneur, uh, which means systems and process. That's not typically high on my list. I like to dream big, go charge ahead and then, I look to my left and something else looks exciting. And then I go, Hey, what's over there. And I do that too, you know? So the system and process part was something I knew someone else was going to have was I could start it, but someone else is going to have to take the charge because, you know, I, I'm only owning a business because I enjoy doing it. And the system and process as fun as it can be um, for, for an entrepreneur sometimes can, can really drag you down, you know, cause the details part of a business is not nearly as exciting as the dream the dreaming. Yeah, I feel you on that. I feel you 100% on that. So was this the turning point after this, after you implemented these systems and you had started being more, you you started paying more attention to the bottom line and how, how all the uh, the systems worked to get consistent profits. Was that the turning point? And then from there on out, you felt like you had more control? Well, so we, yeah, it was the turning point in the sense that I had a lot of turning points, uh, but that was sort of the final turning point to get us to franchising because we had we didn't have enough consistent unit economics across the 12 stores for for us to call this a real brand because quality would be different from place to place but again more importantly profitability was different from from store to store once we streamlined that and recognized that you could produce the same quality product and service and generate the same profits i uh I said, well, let's let's consider franchising. I've got a great story there if you want to hear it. And I so, do. Um, so I was in Vegas at a at an industry conference, and I was, uh, you know, one of those big ballrooms or whatever. And I was 
didn't want to hear it because I had to check some email or something. And so I left the ballroom, took my laptop out with me, was checking email. And I, I was at a table where no one else was there. And this guy sits down across from me and I'm like, dang it. You know, this dude's going to want to talk. I really got some work to do. Um, and he's like, starts talking, of course. He's like, hey, what do you do? And I'm like, um, you know, you know that exchange. And so I start telling him, you know, bragging really like 12 stores, you know, blah, 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 franchising maybe is our next venture. Things are growing great. Made it into a magazine a few months ago. And I'm from the South. So you have to return that gesture, you know. As, what do you do? As, as, yeah. What do you do? And he goes, oh, my name's Fred DeLuca. I started this thing called Subway. I have no 42,000 like it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I immediately stopped checking email and said, oh, you know, let's let's talk. Oh, and, you know, from that point on, uh, we developed a, a relationship, a friendship, a mentorship. And he helped me guide my way from just being this corporate store, you know, business to a franchise entity. And he taught me so much along the way that, and he never charged one dime for any of it, you know? And so it was a crazy, crazy, just stroke of luck. Uh, but it, it was, um, it was a pretty cool experience to, to, to be able to talk to him about, about the industry that he kind of created. Wow. So you had him, on, he gave you his number and said, you can give me a buzz, whatever you, you know, like, yeah. you want to talk. Well, that's not how it started initially, but eventually, yes. Wow. Uh, but yeah. So we 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 spent about an hour together that day, and he uh, he connected me with someone who works like his gatekeeper or whatever, and I thought that would be the end of it, but we made it through the gatekeeper and had a lot of other conversations, and he told me so many cool things, you know, that I still use today that 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 I'll never forget, you know. For instance, his. You know, you got a guy who had 42,000 locations. He is, he is franchising. Like that's, yeah. you know, he's a all time legend and you think that he had it all done right. And everything he would talk to me about was what he did. He did wrong. And I'm like, gosh, you, you cannot think that way. You've done everything right. Uh, but one of the things he felt like he did wrong was over time, the business model shifted, you know, the margins for the early subways are very strong, like super strong, crazy strong, stronger than you'd see in normal food service. And over time, franchisees would come to him and say, hey, we can do this better this way. It's more expensive, but we can do it better by using this piece of technology or automate this or whatever. And, you know, you want to make people happy. And so you're like, sure, let's do it because it is better. Why make, why use your two hands when a piece of technology can do it? And so you do that, you do this, you do that, you do that. And all of a sudden, 15, 20 years later, you look back and all of a sudden those margins that were so impressive 20 years ago are now, you know, really low single digits. Life's a lot easier for a franchisee, you know, 20 years later than it was 20 years ago, but not nearly as profitable as it was 20 years ago. Hmm. And so he cautioned me, obviously automation technology, we can't be, you know, old school and just say, well, I'm not changing uh, but be very careful to not make lives too easy because the only reason we're successful right now is not because this is an easy business. It's because it's a profitable business. So um, try to maintain the bottom line, um, strong margins that we have for as long as possible. Yeah. Great advice. Great advice. I heard yeah. about, I, I've researched uh, Fred DeLuca a little bit. Um, you know, the first couple of stores were failures. He just kept growing uh, by with borrowed money and it wasn't making money the first couple of locations. He just faked yep. that they made it. <laughs> That's absolutely. Yeah. You know, he's kind of got a very similar. Yeah. I mean, he has sort of a McDonald's story that a lot of the early investors were like doctor buddies, you know, and all the doctor money was there and he was around it. And that's what fueled it. But the doctor buddies didn't want to make sandwiches, you know, so they they weren't going to be inside the business. And so it had to get he eventually he had to start finding different ways to get operators inside the business that cared about the work, you know, cared about the product uh, along with the investment. Sure, sure. Man, uh, yeah, he, he passed away, I believe. Right. Didn't it, yeah, he, not he passed away a couple of years after we met. So we had a, a, a short a short relationship, but it was a, it was a really a cool one to say the least. So. Definitely. And your position, I mean, yeah, getting to meet Fred DeLuca 
talk about a sign. You know, you're like, hey, guy, show me a sign. All of a sudden, Fred DeLucas <laughs> is on, and you, and you got this uh, attitude like you don't want to, like, you don't want to talk to him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then you find out who he is. He's like, holy shit. Um, so tell me about the, I want to hear about the Warren Buffett story too, because you, why were you going to Omaha? Did you get to meet him? I've never met Warren Buffett. I've always wanted to meet Warren Buffett. I, uh, I've had the honor actually over the years to become like known as this like Warren Buffett wannabe. And so a few years ago, CNBC reached out to me and they heard about it somehow. And, you know, they, I had a successful business and they were doing a documentary on Warren Buffett wannabes. <laughs> and so <laughs> they, they did a documentary on two maids and a mop and the story. They came to our franchise conference and met all of our franchisees. I was able to go to New York uh, inside CNBC headquarters. They interviewed me there. And um, the coolest part ever was every year, what this, just happens every May, uh, Warren Buffett and his business, Berkshire Hathaway, has a shareholder conference in Omaha, Nebraska. That's why yeah. I was flying back and forth from there. And the it's a it's six hours of Q&A. But before the Q&A starts, every year they do a quick video on different things. Usually it's comical and funny. But three or four years ago, they aired the documentary about two maids and a mob at the Berkshire Hathaway shareholder conference. And Warren Buffett watched it. Now I don't, I didn't see his eyes watch it, but he was in the room with ten thousand other people, um, and he watched the story about two maids and a mop and about how um, I have fashioned my life like his own. Uh, I, you know, I'm not from the Midwest, but I have a very Midwestern sort of value system, and so I think that's one of the reasons I've been so attracted to him. But it, it's not the billions of dollars and all that good stuff. It's just the way he makes seem everything seem so easy. Uh, really complex matters seem very simple. Um, and obviously the success, you know, and I, I love, I love everything about Warren Buffett. And so I've tried to, I've read every book there is possible. I've watched every video. I used to, in the old days, pre-kids, go to every shareholder conference in Omaha. And whenever that thing aired, uh, it was pretty cool. But to hear that Warren Buffett watched the story about two maids in a mop, even though it was only five minutes long, uh, that was like a, that was to me, I made it. That was my Super Bowl Tom Brady moment. Sure. Sure, I believe it. I mean, absolutely. It's a, that's a, that's a big accomplishment, honestly. Because you got, you got a lot of important people in that in that room. Yeah, yeah. Well, of- that's so we had from that room. We actually had hundreds of people who reached out um, and wanted you know to know about franchising. And so we've got a few people in our network now who are also Warren Buffett fans, like myself, because of that five minute video. Isn't that awesome? Wow, man. I, so what's the plans for the future? Are you still, you, I, I looked up the territories you have left. By the way, you have some by me in Naperville, uh, Illinois. I'm yeah, like, we have a- one of my franchisees is opening a pizzeria in, in Naperville. So uh, I'm helping him with that right now. And, and I noticed that you have a, a cleaning service out there. Uh, yep. So that's awesome. Yeah, Naper- it's a great, it's a great market for us. Great operator. We have a, we have a few in the Chicago land area. Uh, so if you look at our footprint, you'll see that since we were in the Southeast, a lot of the stores organically kind of grew within the Southeast. Initially, we over the last four or five years have sort of gotten out of that Southern sort of trademark. And we're as far as California to, to Florida. Now, uh, we, we have a lot of interest, you know, throughout the country, we've got another 200 territories left to develop. We, we are in 89 markets now, but there's, there's only the markets that we want to be in are, you know, suburban markets that have a large number of dual income households. You know, we, we look for markets that have anywhere from 150 to 200,000 total households. Within that, we want about at least 50% of those to be qualified and are financially qualified. Um, if we can find a territory that meets that, that, that profile, then we want to be inside of it. And so we, we have a lot of opportunity at West. Uh, a lot of opportunity in the Southwest. One of our best performing stores is just kick and tell in the Phoenix area. And I, I, I can't even believe the kind of results we're seeing from, from the, from the <laughs> store there. It's just through the roof. Uh, sure. And for that matter, all of our, I mean, we, we've got, uh, I guess post COVID is the wrong way to describe it, but post lockdowns, post lockdowns from COVID, the demand has always been strong in our industry, but I've never seen anything like it right now. It is ridiculous we can't keep up you know we have franchises calling us saying can you pause marketing uh, because we just can't keep up there's the phones are ringing off the hook yeah that's that's what you call high class problems but we need it we need that after what we've been through for the last year 
I totally agree. It's it's uh, it was a rough 2020 to say to say the least. To say the least. That's a, that's a yeah. very nice way of putting it. Um, Ron, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Uh, you've taken the time. Um, you know, you, you are, you are, you're a good guy. I could tell. And I appreciate uh, all your time, man. I hope you have a great rest of your day and I'll let you know when this gets aired. All right, John, thanks for your time. Anybody out there wants to learn about two maids and a mop easy to find us two maids, franchise.com. You'll learn all about the investment opportunity. You'll hear stories from franchisees across the country and you'll see a little bit of, about my story as well on there too. All right. Awesome. Take care, Ron. Have a great day. You too. Bye.